lot of empty chairs here. Oh, I guess time to start. All right, so um, thanks everyone for coming. Um, it's a pretty big room for the size of the audience here, but I guess that should be okay. Um, so my name is Michael Lay, and I'm here to uh, talk about um, how we automated the process of creating a Spark cluster um, that is secure and that is HIPAA enabled. Um, so this work was done at uh, IBM in collaboration with some of my colleagues, um, notably Jayram, uh, Shu, as well as Daniel Dean. Okay, so it's probably not too much of a surprise for most people in this room here that um, there's a lot of information that's personal that's being collected, stored, and um, processed um, uh, by various companies, right? Some of this information can be in a form of uh, health information, like our level of glucose, our heart rate, some medical, um, uh, from results from medical labs and so forth, right? As well as our, what disease we have and medication we take. And besides just health information, there's also financial information, like how much money we have in the bank or how little money we have in the bank, as well as the different investment portfolios and so forth, right? So in order to make use of this information and generate values from this information, companies usually will deploy analytics back end in order to process information either real time and also to uh, um, use this information along with the information that they've amassed throughout the years, right? In order to uh, generate some values and some prediction from this information. Um, so in a lot of these cases, what you have is this back end that needs to process information. A lot of information can be very private to us. And the problem with that is that even though it can generate a lot of value, uh, both for a company in order to create interesting applications, um, it also can prove to be a security concern, right? So a lot of organizations have, or governmental regulations have been created in order to protect this data, right? Some of these uh, regulations include HIPAA or its extension to HIPAA, the high tech um, uh, act, as well as, uh, that's, that's sort of in the health industry. Also in the financial industry, there's this PCI and various other type of regulations. And a lot of these regulations try to try to do is protect the privacy of the data that's being generated, as well as to govern how this data can be accessed by others. Um, a lot of these regulations also put into effect these uh, rules in order to help um, companies and regulators audit how this data are accessed. So it's just in case that there's data breaches, information can be um, obtained in order to figure out what data were, uh, were, caused, uh, were leaked and how was that leak uh, caused and who accessed that data last. Right? So all, that, all that's really important for the auditing uh, capability of the system. So what I really want to talk about today is really a, a combination of two things, right? How regulation like HIPAA uh, affects things uh, of how analytics backend are designed and architected. Right, so as developers and administrator, when you create these backends for analytics purposes, you have to take into account a lot of security concerns and regulation concerns in order to build out a platform that is um, compliant uh, to these regulations. Right, so building it out manually is actually very challenging. Um, and there's essentially three reasons I listed up in the slides here. First of all is that the regulations that's written are written by a bunch of lawyers and be able to translate these regulations into specific security mechanism to implement is actually pretty challenging because it's not really clear how to map one-to-one -one what these general regulations uh, mean and try to do to a particular mechanism in your system, right? So that's one aspect. The second aspect is that even though you have these mechanisms, there are actually, per mechanisms, there's actually a lot of options, a lot of things and knobs you can tune uh, that will affect how the mechanism will, will act and behave. Right, so there's a lot of these things like, you know, different type of user account, how to maintain access control, a lot of key certificates, databases that has to be maintained in order to actually maintain a full secure environment. Right, and the third aspect is not really the aspect of the environment itself, but this is more of like ops environment or ops capability. Right, a lot of time when you build out this, this system and to deploy the secure platform for other people to use, and you're maybe within your own company to test out, um, building it manually is not very effective since maybe some different groups who also want this platform uh, want to test out their particular solution against this uh, back end. You have to then manually redeploy all this thing, which can be really time consuming and actually can lead to a lot of failures, right? So you want to be able to have a mechanism that can automate this process for you. Every time you spin up a back end that is secure, you want it to have 
the capability of spinning up a backend that is, has all this mechanism in play, and you just click a button and you generate a new set of cluster that has all these compliance uh, mechanisms in place. Right, so the approach we took and uh, what we did was we leveraged um, OpenStack Sahara to give us the capability of automating and configuring um, the backend platform, right? So the, the kind of the, the crux of the solution here is to expose uh, secure building blocks um, that users can, or administrators can choose and select in order to build out their security um, platform. Right? Given this ability, you can then automate the process of creating a backend that is, or an analytics backend that is um, uh, compliant to some regulation. So what we did was we prototyped this uh, mechanism in Sahara um, uh, by creating a Spark uh, cluster for our analytics purposes, uh, running on top of uh, Yarn, and you see why later, why we chose Yarn, because some of the security uh, aspect of it. Um, and also in this talk, I'll be just focusing on the HIPAA aspect. Uh, I know there's a lot of regulation out there, and if you have the secure building blocks, uh, hopefully the idea is then you can mix and match different security mechanisms in order to um, uh, make your solution uh, applicable to a particular regulation, right? Okay, so this is kind of the outline of the talk. First, I'm gonna give a brief overview of what you know, HIPAA is, since this is what we're talking about, and then discuss uh, briefly the design architecture of our secure Spark platform. And then I'll say how those mechanisms that we implemented maps into HIPAA, right? That gives you a little bit of an idea of how certain security mechanisms will interplay with the regulation that is HIPAA. Um, then I'm gonna talk about some of the Sahara features that we've uh, augmented and extended in order to help us with this process. And then I'll summarize and give you guys some lessons in uh, future directions I think the Sahara project will, um, or the Sahara project can take on that could be very useful uh, for the rest of us. So HIPAA in general, for those who don't know, is essentially a Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act that was passed, uh, I believe, in 1996 in order to, you know, very broad stroke to help the, um, uh, the efficiency and effectiveness of the healthcare systems in the U.S. So it had regulated some aspect of how data is, uh, health information is, is standardized, the health information uh, record keeping, and how those information is transmitted um, and so forth, right? It makes it uh, easier and more efficient in some way. Also, it extended to security protocols to ensure that the privacy and security and integrity of some of this data is maintained, right? So what data is protected here is essentially any data that's designated as protected health information or PHI um, that relates to medication, uh, you know, kind of disease you have, all that information, measurements and so forth, right? All that data is protected. And who does this particularly apply to? So it applies to um, any entity that is providing healthcare, as well as entity that is business associate. So this is important to IT providers that consume this information, store and process this information, right? So if you touch this information somehow, you are now um, uh, uh, under such a supervision of this particular regulation, right? So um, companies that do analytics on this data, you sort of have to be concerned about this particular regulation, right? So in general, TIP has two rules. This is a privacy rule and this is a security rule. So privacy rule is kind of um, intuitive in the sense that it helps protect the privacy to PHI. Now the security rule is the one that actually um, operationalizes this privacy rule, right? So in general, what it takes is that we need to provide confidentiality, integrity, as well as availability of the data, right? And, be, and beyond that, the regulation also specified that we have to take enough precaution to anticipate any type of, uh, anticipate any type of uh, potential threat to the system and potential leak of the data, right? As well as in, ensure that your workforce, your, your environment is compliant at all time, all right? <clears throat> so high tech took that and kind of extended a little bit, adding uh, regulation that require um, maintaining audit logs as well as um, uh, policies to help evaluate the system uh, as you, as the runtime of the system uh, continues, uh, operationalizes the system, right? So um, maintaining, uh, make sure that the appropriate level of security is maintained and so forth. So just focusing on the security rule aspect, since that's the one that, you know, you can actually um, do something about, right? There's actually three aspects. There's administrative, physical, and the technical safeguards. So I'm not really gonna talk about the other aspects here in terms of administration and the physical part. I'm just really gonna focus on the technical part, since that's something that we can do in software, right? So that's why I titled this uh, talk as not HIPAA compliant, analytics platform is really HIPAA enabled. Since to be compliant, you have to take into account many other aspects, not just the technical aspect, right? There's the administration aspect too. 
So within technical safeguards, right, there are four things. There's access control, audit control, integrity control, as well as transmission security. So you see later on when I describe the platform, and I will go through the different mechanisms that were used in different levels, and I'll say how those levels are then actually match up to the different control mechanisms that is, is specified in the regulation. So let me just pivot a little bit here that I just kind of you know, really briefly went through what HIPAA is, and let me pivot a little bit, describe essentially the analytics platform that, that we've uh, developed, and put it into a particular context so you understand you know, how, why we built this platform the way it is built, and then give you uh, the mapping between that platform and how uh, HIPAA is regulated. Right, so the, the goal of this platform we want to build out is very general in the sense that we want to be able to plug this Spark Analytics platform pretty much as a service to any, uh, as a piece of uh, the entire platform that processes uh, protected health information, right? So this is an analytics backend for that piece. So there's a lot of other pieces like storage, data lake that has to be there. There's a lot of authentic me authentication mechanism that has to be in place to enter into the system. But at some point, this data will flow and hit the analytics, and the analytics engine will have to pick this up and process this very protected data, right? So this piece is sort of an independent piece we want to build out. It's very secure in a sense that it has maybe potentially more mechanism you need to be HIPAA enabled, but um, it helps the developer in the sense that if you take this piece out and plug it into some other uh, uh, platform that requires this particular security, you have it there. Right? So that's also uh, why I think the ability to build building blocks, uh, small pieces of security mechanism to be able to pluggable into your system is helpful in the sense that if you have a different platform, a different assumption about how security works, you can either remove or add in different mechanism as you go. Right, so that, that could be a very useful thing there. So this, this, some of the assumptions I've listed here is this. Right? There is, this system has essentially two types of user. One is an administrator. So administrator can go in and create, using Sahara, stand up this platform that is um, the analytics platform that's secure. And then there's a user of the platform, which is essentially the user that just goes and make use of the cluster or the analytics part. Right? He, he or she doesn't need to know what are the mechanisms underneath it. He, he or she just uh, submits a job and runs the analytics on this data. Uh, and this, this whole process will be secure. And, uh, and the different user will be isolated from each other, right? Um, we assume that given one analytics cluster, there are different users in this cluster, right? So there could be like one hospital, but many doctors in that hospital uh, can use this analytics cluster to process information for different patients. And each of the doctors can maybe have different access control. Um, maybe it can access, Dr. A can only access um, a group of patient, you know, Y, and you know, Dr. B access patient Z but uh, not, not the other way around, for instance. Right? So there's different isolation mechanisms need to be in place for the users in the Spark cluster as well. <clears throat> so um, we also assume that there's one essentially yarn cluster that runs Spark per tenant. So you have this different hospital come in. We're going to spin them up a different cluster uh, that's separate from the, uh, the previous cluster. Right? So different it's not multi-tenant in that way, uh, even though the definition of tenancy can be, I know, uh, different for different people. But that's how we. Uh, uh, we stated in, in our particular use case. So any data that's external to the cluster, if you have a data lake that stores information about patients, uh, we assume that there's a driver that can securely ingest that data in. So essentially that needs to be a driver that's implemented in Spark, or you can be leveraged by Spark to pull data in from a lake, and then from that point on, uh, our system takes over to make sure those data, when analyzed, uh, is protected and uh, um, is compliant to the regulation. Okay. All right, so here's the design of the, um, the Spark service that we have. Essentially, it's broken up to three different layers, right? The very first top layer is our Spark cluster. Um, that's where all the Spark analytics service is running, right? So the different um, user runs and different Spark jobs will run in isolated containers. So in Yarn, they call this secure container. And what that just really means is that the user, uh, um, sorry, the container executing the job is executed as a user ID of the job submitter. So in general, sometimes you build a Spark cluster and there's essentially one user, let's like say Spark, and every job you submit to that cluster, you run as the Spark user. So that is good in some sense, but not great And when you want isolation between different jobs, right? If you have multiple users, then you need to have multiple user accounts that you can actually have access control across the different jobs, right? So secure container is great in that way. That it gives you the ability to start containers with the process ID of the job submitter. Um, below that Spark cluster is actually the Yarn resource manager, right? So it has different components in there, which is not too important. Uh, one important component is that it has Kerberos. 
So uh, there's Yarn component is really tightly integrated with Kerberos authentication mechanism, right? This allows you to uh, force the authentication of different components in Yarn, different components uh, like the host itself, the VM that is launched, uh, that is associated with the cluster, as well as the framework that's running on top of Yarn. In this case, that's Spark, right? We want to ensure in an environment where you can't have some other uh, user going into your, uh, your cluster creation mechanism, create a, spin up a VM, and say that, hey, I'm running a Yarn process. Let me attach to your Yarn cluster without being authenticated, because then you have essentially a rogue uh, Yarn uh, node that now you know, can consume and you know, uh, participate in all the data ingestion of your original secure cluster. Right? So you need authentication that way. You need authenticate across machine, VM, as well as the framework running on top of that VM in order to ensure that there's, there's isolation and security across the entire stack. Um, so all that is run on and provisioned by the Sahara service, right? So we use Sahara to automate this process of spinning up this uh, cluster that has all the security mechanism in place. All the nodes are set up with all the SSL encryption, all the authentication mechanism in Kerberos, and also extended to have different user account created for a particular tenant, right? All that has to be there in order for this to work. Okay, so that's sort of the layout of um, how our Spark cluster is designed. Now let me go back and just map some of the security mechanisms I just said into this HIPAA regulation. Right? So I broke that, this table sort of breaks down the different four controls that I mentioned earlier, the access control, audit control, integrity, as well as transmission security. Right? So it's, not, it's probably not uh, mind-blowing in any way, but you can see the mechanisms that I've listed in terms of for access control, for instance. Right? There's Kerberos for authentication of different components. There's secure containers for isolation of different users. Right, there's HDFS file permissions uh, you need to when you write and store data for a particular user, and right? you need that. And HD, HDFS security zones in order to encrypt the data at rest. Right, so encryption happens both on the disk level when data are stored, as well as during transmission. Right, you need to have that encrypted as well when you're transmitting, because Spark does shuffling, so it does sending data across different nodes for processing. That path also needs to be encrypted. And any data that is being generated, cached and so forth, those also need to be outputted to directories that has encryption on it to make sure that no data is ever exposed, right? So I sort of skipped the, the path of you know, what happens to data when it's in memory, now it's unencrypted, right? So there's actually an issue there, um, and it depends on uh, how paranoid you are. Um, you can have mechanism that also does encryption in memory as well, right? So obviously there's a penalty in performance, but you could do that if you want to. Um, and actually that goes back to my point that there's all these different mechanisms and the regulation, like HIPAA, never specified exactly how to actually implement this thing, right? So it, it, it just tells you that you need to make sure that these things are really secure and maintain isolation, but it doesn't tell you actually how to do it. Um, and you can be paranoid if you want. So having mechanism like Sahara that we build into Sahara that allows you to essentially select different levels of security, it can be a very useful thing um, to help you deploy your system in a way that you can test out the functionality to compare the performance of those things versus the security level you get. Right, so that can be a very useful um, aspect. Um, I won't actually go through the rest because um, some of it's kind of intuitive. I want that you want to point out is in terms of audit controls, right? We have the ability out there to already log, you know, what type of job is submitted, uh, what type of files are accessed. But one thing is that the framework accessing the data, right? Like this, in, in this sense, is a Spark uh, ingesting the data to process. Spark itself right now doesn't have mechanism to log what data did it ingest, you know, what RDD did it form. Uh, what piece of data it touched, and when that piece of data is written out to disk for like, you know, caching and so forth. None of that is logged, right? So what we did in, uh, in IBM Research, we actually extended Spark to create a logging mechanism that allows us to actually log the pieces of data that is read on HDFS that it can um, log and send to the auditor so that it can also be part of the logging mechanism uh, that is there, right? So to make sure that the whole process is uh, uh, every piece of data's access is logged. That's essentially what I want to say. Okay, so let, let me now touch upon um, the Sahara piece that we've uh, implemented in order to make this possible, right? So there's essentially four pieces of work here. One is automating the security enablement, right? That's one piece. There's also a piece that allows extension of Sahara to enable uh, adding essentially different users to the cluster. Right, so that, that's not quite there yet, uh, and it's also debatable where this, whether this belongs to Sahara API or not, um, but we've extended the API to give us this ability. Um, and third and fourth thing is the ability to submit different type of jobs given one particular Yarn cluster. So I know this exists in the Cloudera version, 
in, uh, in, um, in Sahara, but the vanilla version of uh, Sahara running like just vanilla Hadoop or, or, or Yarn, uh, right now it doesn't have the ability to submit both like a Spark job as well as a Hadoop job very easily. Right? You can do one or not the other. <clears throat> so now, I'll, and at the end, I'll summarize uh, some of these lessons. So just in case um, people are not familiar with how Sahara works or how to spin up a cluster that is using Sahara, right? So Sahara is done in a VM image-based way. So you, essentially what you do is you take a VM, you create uh, a disk filled with it with uh, binaries that you want to actually run uh, in your cluster, right? You do that out, you know, out of band by some administrator. You upload it to something like Glance. Um, once you have that, then you use the Sahara interface and to define what your cluster looks like. I wanted to say a cluster of, let's say, five nodes. Each node has certain flavors of VMs, um, certain size, what process I want to run in those VMs. And then once you have that particular template, then you can go to Sahara to deploy and provision, right? So the provisioning engine of Sahara essentially just leverages heat, right? So it generates a heat template and uses heat to then create uh, and spin up the VMs for you, right? Um, and once that is done, you know, the heat talks with different components of uh, OpenStack, Nova, Neutron, Glance, and other things to create those VMs. So once that is done, there's a last step where Sahara is actually comes in play again, is that it will SSH into each of those VMs and then configure the VMs uh, in a way that is appropriate for your particular deployment. So if you want to run Hadoop, it goes in there and does some configuration settings and changes, and then it launches the uh, Hadoop daemons to, uh, to then finish the process, right? So in some sense, it's not very clear in terms of the hard API, in terms of how much do you want to bake into the images and how much you want to let it uh, configuration at runtime, uh, the, the configuration take over. You know, you can, just, could, you can actually SSH in, then do the pool to get the binaries and then configure, right? So there's actually no clean way uh, of how to set it up, but so you have to use your judgment in terms of how much you want to pre-create and how much you want to do it at runtime. <clears throat> so this is the, um, proof of concept that we've, uh, I want to show you some of the screenshots of how our system looks like and what changes we made into the, uh, the GUI part of the Sahara to instantiate a different configuration mechanisms that I mentioned before, right? So this is a familiar Horizon interface. Uh, we stripped out everything except the Sahara interface. So you have your typical uh, clusters, your cluster template, node group, job submission, and so forth, right? So th those, those things haven't really changed. So what we've added uh, was a, f a couple of things. One is when you create your node group template, right, we've added a few more services here that pertains to security, right? So there's the Kerberos that you can instantiate. There's the KMS, which is the key management system in Hadoop, right? So that's useful for HDFS encryption. Uh, we've added something that's not related to uh, security, but it's very useful service, I think, in general, when you want to run a kind of analytics platform, right? There's something called IPython for interactive query with Spark. There's the Spark job server, which is an external project, this job, uh, external project to Spark that allows you to submit jobs using REST APIs uh, to Spark itself rather than going through the Sahara interface. Um, I'll say why we use that because Sahara interface API is missing one pr uh, crucial thing that we needed that wasn't supported. And I think that's something that we can um, ask the community if they're interested in adding. The other aspect of this is more security aspect, which is when you create a cluster, um, you, can, you can select different types of uh, security modes. So right now, we only essentially have two, right? We have HDF encryption, you can enable that, or you, you can enable both the secure mode of YARN, which is all the authentication mechanism turn on. Now that's between the different components of YARN, as well as authentication with the framework and set up SSL encryption between the different components of YARN, as well as the components of the framework, in this case, Spark. Um, and that's enable, make sure the shuffling is encrypted. So all that gets turned on by just that click. So once you click that option, when you deploy your, your cluster, the full mechanism of, uh, of, of data at rest encryption as well as uh, encryption during transmission is enabled, right? There's also a Kerberos server location here. So um, I'll bring up a little bit later why there is a particular field for that, because there's a different way you can design how Kerberos server should be run, right? There's, you can place it within your cluster you create. So you have a Kerberos server per data analytics um, uh, Spark cluster, or you have one that can be shared by everybody, right? So there's cons and pros uh, for each of that scenario. Um, so the last thing that we've added was essentially um, extra credentials, because what we did was uh, we extended Sahara to not only instantiate a cluster on top of an open stack cloud, but we've also extended to use other cloud, in this case, SoftLayer. Um, so then we obviously need credentials for the SoftLayer account, right? So that's, that's essentially what this is. Um, so since I mentioned that we use uh, Sahara to instantiate on uh, software, there's a lot of components that 
uh, we, we make use in OpenStack, but also some components that we don't have to use anymore. Uh, so this is only pertaining to our particular uh, proof of concept, right? Not necessarily general to everybody. So we make use of essentially um, Sahara, Horizon, the Keystone. We don't actually make use of any of the, the Nova and Glance because the images are now uploaded to the SoftLayers image repository. And then we use the so, uh, SoftLayers um, API to instantiate the VMs on SoftLayer account. So from a Sahara portal, we define what a cluster looks like when we click launch. It actually goes to SoftLayers account and creates the VMs in SoftLayer. So now you have uh, Sahara essentially instantiating and configuring VMs and cluster of VMs on top of software. <clears throat> so this is the flow that I showed earlier how Sahara works, and the only thing we've changed is the one I highlighted in, 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 in slightly orangish color there. So instead of the heat template talking to different uh, OpenStack components, now we have a new uh, heat resource plugin that we use that will then instantiate um, uh, VMs on software by going through the software Python binding, right? So that's the only piece that we changed that allows us to now create and launch VMs on SoftLayer instead of OpenStack. <clears throat> so the process of, of, of setting Sahara up to, um, to do what I've just said uh, is pretty much follows the normal route of, uh, of booting anything in Sahara, except for the four, five, and six. So this is what we had to do um, to change Sahara's internal code in order to enable the configuration and the deployment of security functions in, in, in Yarn and Spark, right? So we have to change how when the cluster comes up, we have the SSH into these machines and we have to configure the, this, 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 the different configuration properties uh, to make sure that we enable some of these features, right? So that's pretty straightforward. Um, maintaining the Kerberos the keys and SL certificate uh, is also something we have to do, as well as creating user account um, and setting up the different HDFS directories for each user is also automated in this whole process, right? So in terms of the um, image that we prepared, what we've ended up doing is that we've uh, baked these particular uh, binaries into the image, right? So we have Hadoop, Spark, the Kerberos engine, as well as the two um, uh, Spark job servers, as well as this Jupyter or this IPython thing. So that's essentially the, image, the, the type of binaries we have in our image, right? So given those image, we can then uh, spin up the cluster and then, and then SSH into the machine using Sahara to then configure all the different options that we want, right? So right now, this image creation is very manual. Um, I sort of have to do this manually. There is an, uh, the uh, disk image builder um, that, that you can extend to do this, but this works mainly, this, this image builder is really useful for uh, the OpenStack uh, uh, creation process. Um, to automate this for like software, you need to access some extension in order to make it automatically push it up to the software account that you want to use. Because this is, you know, we, we set up our cloud uh, on the software account rather than OpenStack. Um, so one aspect I want to touch upon is that a lot of this security mechanism is leveraged on uh, how well you can authenticate your user, right? So Kerberos is a very central key to this piece. Right, so this essentially shows you what, how security and Kerberos work, but I just want to point out one particular thing that has to do with, you know, how do you manage uh, when you're spinning up clusters and you have to interact with Kerberos, and that is how do you manage authentication with Kerberos, right? So normally, as a user or a human being, you can type in your credentials as you log into the Kerberos system, right? With processes and things like that, um, it uses what is a, called a key tab. That's essentially an encrypted, um, uh, a key or a file that is associated with that principal's password. So that's essentially just a file that is stored somewhere, and that process has access to that file, and that file is essentially the key that you say, here, here, Kerberos, I am this person that I say I am, and then Kerberos will again give you a key that is, go through some you know, exchanges to then give you the credentials to access that service you want. Right? So this is a very essential piece of the authentication mechanism, and this key tab essentially is a file. So what we do now is we, we uh, um, uh, install this file per user in the local file system of all the nodes on that cluster, right? So that is only probably a temporary solution that's probably not good in the sense that you able to break the account of that particular user uh, or break the account of a different users you can access to your keys, right? So you pr probably something that could be useful later on is actually use some kind of key management system where you put the key tabs in that management system uh, separately from the cluster of analytics cluster you have. Right? So I just want to point that out as an important um, a uh, piece of security that is kind of left out in this design. Um, and also, with respect to Kerberos itself also, there's different ways, like I mentioned earlier, how you can run Kerberos server, right? So you can have Sahara controlling various cluster of analytics, right? So you have a Spark cluster that's one, two, and you know, up to N, 
and it's controlling all these pieces, right? So now the question is, what do you do with this Kerberos uh, server? You can, you have different configuration. You can actually insert it into your particular cluster, so the Kerberos is only um, local to that cluster. Or you can have a, you, a separate Kerberos server that's shown that figure there, and then you know different cluster can then access that Kerberos server, right? So there's pros and cons of this thing. Um, one, you know, obviously, if you share it, that's more efficient. But then you have you can run into issues of uh, collision in terms of namespace and so forth. Now you have to uh, there's ways to um, overcome that, but that, that requires a more complicated setup in Kerberos, right? So you have a Kerberos for each cluster, then you can overcome that issue. But then you have the overhead of maintaining a different Kerberos server. Uh, but what helps you is that you have Sahara. You can you don't have to deploy this manually. Once you set it up once, configure it once, you can click a button and it will deploy multiple instances exactly the same. And, you know, with different uh, number of VMs and sizes as you want. But once you do it once, you can, you can overcome this problem, right? Um, so this is a little small, it's a little crowded, but this essentially goes through some of the, pro the steps we took in order to automate this, all these setting up uh, of, the, of the secure Spark service, right? So during creating the cluster, right, there's multiple things you have to go through. Um, you have to do things that are per node, that is setting up the Kerberos, uh, setting up the key tabs per VM host. Right, and generating the different keys for different yarn services, uh, and then pushing those out to different nodes. Um, you have to set up the configuration to secure container. That requires editing a lot of Hadoop configuration. All that's done for you automatically. And then per user, you have to configure also the principal for that user. Right? If you have different user, they have to create different principles. The user will store them somewhere. Um, and as well as you know, setting up the SSL security certificates and all that stuff per user and per VMs. Right? And you push that out, and you use Sahara, uh, mechanism, you sort of have to program this once, and now you have this ability to just push and play, essentially. Um, you also have to worry about, you know, Sahara gives you the ability to scale in and out your cluster, right? So you also want to make sure that when you do this, uh, you can leverage the fact that when you scale out, you're adding another node. What that means is that now you have another node joining your system. This is a legitimate node. So therefore, you have to add uh, different key tabs and uh, um, CA, um, sorry, certificates for that um, node. Uh, and update all your existing nodes to make sure that those existing nodes now know that this node is legitimate uh, and that it can join, successfully join the cluster you created. And so this is make sure that the security that you push out is going to be um, a legitimate one rather than having some random node coming up in a cloud and joining your cluster. So that is sort of an assumption we made in the sense that different nodes can join your cluster uh, unsecurely. So you have a setup where you do some kind of VLAN or you have separate a network uh, for your system, then maybe that mechanism might not, might not be too useful, and you can uh, not use that mechanism at all, right? Uh, that depends on how you're set up of your configuring your, your, your network stack. <clears throat> so, so that's sort of enabling security, right? So there's also the aspect of adding multiple users to a Spark cluster on using, or, or any analytic cluster in your environment, right? So, so right now, Sahara doesn't give you the ability to essentially stand up uh, a cluster that has multiple users. It stands up a cluster with a single user, and you, every job you submit to this cluster essentially run as a, I think it's a Hadoop job um, right now by default. Um, so that's not very useful in terms of you want to maintain isolation between the different users of your cluster. Right? So we, we would like to, or we have done, and we would like to um, make this known that we extended the API to add another user uh, through Sahara. So this way, uh, your administrator can go in as part of the onboarding process. I'm sure there's probably uh, a lot more complicated than that, but at some point, you probably need to call this API to add this user into your, into your cluster. And this user can be uh, instantiated, creating different Unix accounts, setting up HDFS permission directories so that the uh, new user can now be isolated from different users in your system. Right? So what we did was this, we extended the, um, the REST API, this v10 um, file, to add a new uh, um, API for adding user. So this user, when you invoke this API, all it really does is these three things. right? Go on to every node to create a new Unix account, create an HDFS directory account, and then distribute the Kerberos key for this user to all the nodes in the system that, that, needs to, that it needs to access in order to run its Spark job. Right? <clears throat> so one of the challenges we found when doing this was that the assumption in Sahara is that the cluster, when, when a cluster is created, there's only a single user, and that's a dupe. So we have to essentially go through and modify how the assumption of Sahara code works so that we make sure that um, it's not hard coded in there as a single user being used. Uh, we want to make sure this is uh, more parameterized so that it's later on be easier to extend uh, the, the different users in the system. Um, 
the third thing that we did here was allowing uh, Spark jobs as well as uh, Hadoop-based job to be submitted to a cluster. So I know there's you know, ways to submit a Spark job already and a way to submit a Hadoop job already. Um, combining those two in the vanilla version of Yarn isn't there. So we did something very simple. Right? We didn't have to extend any API or anything, but we allow the uh, Spark jobs and Hadoop job to be uh, executed in the same cluster by essentially just taking in what job was submitted based on that job type and the cluster type which is essentially uh, create a string that is Spark submit string with the right appropriate parameters for submitting to, to, to Yarn and submitting that um, uh, a string to the cluster, or the Spark master to run. All right, so that's not, um, it's, not it's, it's a simple matter and it's not, it doesn't take too much work there and I think the um, uh, implementation is pretty straightforward as well. Um, so the last thing we did was, as I mentioned, we did run our uh, cluster on SoftLayer, and this work was actually done not with this project, but with something else uh, some, some years ago by different members of the group um, that added a heat plugin in order to allow heat to work with um, SoftLayer. Right? So essentially added a no, another uh, heat resource that's a SoftLayer VM, um, and given that resource uh, and the Python binding to SoftLayer, you can create a cluster on top of SoftLayer. And this is just a screenshot of what has to be uh, extended in Sahara in order to, to make use of this feature. And that is, like I mentioned before, when Sahara generates or provision a cluster, it creates a heat template, right? So the only thing you have to change in order to make Sahara work with another cloud is essentially to change the output of this heat template um, to make use of the resources that a heat template is tied to, in this case, a soft layer VM. Right? Once you do that, then Sahara essentially just works with, can work with another cloud. <clears throat> Okay, so let me just quickly summarize here. So I, I talked about um, some HIPAA requirement and some usefulness of being able to use something like Sahara to automate, configure your deployment of your system uh, to make sure that these deployment is uh, uh, com compatible or compliant, however word you want to use, to this particular regulation you have. Right? And I talked about some ways to extend uh, uh, Sahara to make this happen. Now, one interesting or a few couple of things that we've learned when doing this is that it's not always clear um, what security mechanism you need to employ in your system to make some uh, aspect of your system compliant to a regulation, right? It's never clear, it's not, it's not, it, doesn't, it doesn't list out the particular mechanism you have to use. And having ability to selectively um, allow your administrators to select a different component of security is very useful so they can try out different mechanisms and test the performance versus security uh, that they get, right? So that's, that's a very useful thing to have. So componentized security, is very useful, and being able to automate that using something like Sahara is also very useful for the community, I think. Um, and also, the, the one aspect we found out is kind of interesting that when you, even Sahara with the GUI, right, you can just click and point and click to choose, define your cluster, it's actually very intimidating for a lot of users who use the system first time, right? So it's very useful to have very simple templates that maybe doesn't cover all the options, but give them very simple templates to use and users can just select one of those templates to use directly, right? So even with the ability to select different options to define a template, it's actually already intimidating for a lot of users, we found out. So some of the improvements we think uh, could be made uh, is first of all is to actually identify some more of the security components that you can take out and isolate and implement that in Sahara as essentially a unit of security. Right? You allow the people to enable that through Sahara, that could be a very useful thing. Um, we've, we've added the API to add user, but we never delete any user or modify uh, users through Sahara, so we don't have any of those mechanisms. Um, one thing that I mentioned that with the API for um, data analysis through Sahara or job submission through Sahara, there's no way, once you submit a job, a job run, there's no way to actually retrieve any uh, data or results using the Sahara API. So when you submit a job, you sort of, it's assumed that the data is outputted to HDFS or something and that's it. Their user has to go some other mechanism or other route to get this data, right? So it'd be very useful to have Sahara API to actually get this data um, when, when it finishes the job. Um, all right, I'm gonna skip the last point there. So thank you for listening and I will take any questions you might have. So I was perfectly clear and everybody agreed what I said. That's good. Okay, so I'll be around if you guys need to want to talk and chat. Uh, I'll be happy to take your questions. Thank you.